reason. Yes, but um, I, 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 there does seem to be a belief in sort of just natural sentiment in Hume. And there are, and also, also a sense that we could reinvent certain, um, or the artificial virtues, like justice is an artificial virtue. And there seems to be an implication in the discussion of justice that that's something we could reinvent if we needed to by perceiving its utility. No, I don't entirely agree. I, th I, I think custom and what people are used to is yeah. so crucial to, to Hume's moral philosophy, as I understand it, that it makes it, uh, that it leads him repeatedly into positions which, which would totally violate our sense of, for instance, when he talks about the dub double standard in sexual matters, that, that chastity is imposed on women in a way that it's not imposed on men. Totally unjust in principle okay, and reason, okay, but reason is irrelevant because morality's got to rest on what people are used to. Since custom says that women should be treated quite differently from men, then we have to accept that that's a pillar of the moral order. The same with the press gang for the British yeah. Navy. There he will say there's impossible to offer any sensible reason why anyone would defend the press gang in terms of reason or uh, a rational explanation of justice, but we still have to accept it because it's custom and what people are used to. This is always the problem with you. He has what, what, to fall back on this. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, just, uh, yeah. <laughs> One should be uh, reluctant to disagree with such erudition and intellectual history, but I'll give it a shot anyway. Um, it seems to me that in assessing whether uh, Bale-type fideism or Leibniz-type uh, rationalism is uh, more helpful to Christian or, for that matter, Jewish religion, uh, one thing that we ought to consider is whether the religion in question actually does conform to enlightenment or more general human standards of reasonableness or not. Mm -hmm. um, on that issue, it's, it's pretty easy to find uh, statements or examples from Jesus, Paul, and lots of places in the Hebrew Bible to the effect that actually... Uh, there is considerable tension, and childlike faith actually pays off better uh, than ordinary human uh, wisdom and might. Uh, so in light of that, it seems to me that there are some fairly subtle issues in religious epistemology here, and it's not, uh, it, it's not entirely clear that Leibniz-style rationalism was really uh, um, the, the safe path, if you will, for, the, for traditional religious views. Yeah, well, several speakers previously in the conference have uh, spoken with great expertise about the uh, deferential terms in which uh, Leibniz refers to the Christian religion, which indeed he has, has, has to do, of course, in the context in which he's working and in relation to the audience which he's uh, addressing. But the, the, of the relatively, mar well, of, of, of the the um, non-essential character of uh, most of what he has to say about Christian doctrine as such uh, compared to uh, his natural theology. Um, so uh, I think that's, been, that's come out quite clearly in, in, in a number of the discussions that we've had in the last two days. Okay, thank you. Bye. I'd like to thank you very much for a great talk uh, and also for many of your works which have helped uh, me as a student of Bale to understand the context. Um, and the irony is that in, in reading your work, uh, I've come to a very different interpretation of Bale than, than what you began with. Um, so I would like to um, suggest that perhaps in Bale's view, anyway, he wasn't dangerous to religion or he wasn't pernicious, I think is a, is a word that, that you used, but that actually it was Leibniz who was dangerous. Uh, and it's for this reason. It's because we've talked... Uh, in a very abstract fashion about the problem of evil over the last few days. Uh, but, as you know, the Arminian Gomarist controversies at the beginning of the 17th century and then all up to Bale's time, um, the problem of predestination, the problem of evil, uh, was something that ruined many, many lives. And Bale was very conscious of that. His brother died because of a book that yeah. he wrote in response to a Jesuit theologian who accused Calvin yeah. of making God the author of sin. Yeah. Uh, Bale was very aware of that. In his dictionary, in a in a footnote to a remark to the article Synergis, he writes, please see the author of the Commentaire Philosophique, where it's argued that the intractability of a problem is the best foundation for tolerance on that problem. And then what does Bale do in the dictionary? He argues that this is an intractable problem, absolutely insoluble, which I think is reason to believe that Bale is trying to say, let's be tolerant on this issue. Uh, later, in correspondence with his uh, good friend Pierre Desmaisons, he asks him, uh, if he could please translate some passages from a work by Bishop Burnet, who had argued that 
this problem of evil was intractable and gives us all a very good reason to be tolerant on it. This is a bishop. This is not somebody who's trying to undermine religion. And Bale was seeking in his last days. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't live long enough to receive the letter from De Maison. But Bale was trying to align himself in his last days with a bishop who was arguing the same thing, that the insolubility well, of the problem... Careful, careful. There, there are several different and very varying reports of Bale's last days. So that would be a whole study in itself. Some of them are extremely irreverent and give a completely different picture of how he shut the clergyman out of his house and um, uh, were making witticisms which had nothing to do with uh, seeking... Um, uh, reconciliation with the church at the end. Um, but, uh, of course, there's lots of room for disagreement about how to interpret bail, and that debate goes on. But I would hasten to say that I, I, it, it's, it, uh, here I don't think I'm putting forward something at all which is original with me. I'm, I'm relying on uh, some of the best recent work, for instance, Gianluca Mori in Italy, Bail Philosoph, an excellent book, um, which came out about five or six years ago, I think, perhaps a little bit more, uh, Anthony McKenna, the editor of the Bale Correspondence in France. They, they, uh, the, the, there are quite a lot of the best Bale scholars right now who would say that, that Bale is no skeptic and he's no fideist. And, and uh, to my mind, this is, this is entirely correct. I think people are often misled by focusing too much on the Dictionnaire, if I may say so. But, but remember that, well, just two th more things about Bale. Bale's late works are read by hardly anybody, which is a big mistake because the continuation des Pensées diverses in four or five volumes and the Réponse aux questions d'un provincial. This filled Bale's last years. These are very long works that haven't been reprinted, but that's not an excuse for not reading them. They are tremendous books, and I think they give you a, often a, a much more, a much clearer view of just how subversive Bale really is. And remember that with one or two exceptions, Voltaire was an exception. He was willing to argue that, that, that Bale was a skeptic. But that's very unusual in the 18th century. I'm now speaking entirely as a historian, but historical evidence counts for something rather important. Just as most commentators in the 20th century have argued that, that Bale was a phidias and a skeptic, very, very few people argued that in the 18th century. Um, by few, I, I, I mean one or two as against dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of writers who were uh, over a very long span of time, from the end of the 17th century right down to the end of the 18th century, practically everybody agrees that Bale is an extremely subversive, crypto-atheist, dangerous writer. That, that is the normal view in the 18th century. Uh, of course, the, the implication of the insistence that he's a skeptic means that all those writers were mistaken, but I don't think we, can, we, we should be so hasty to assume that they didn't know what they right. were talking about. I think that they had actually a more accurate view <laughs> than, a, than a lot of the 20th century comments. I'll end. I just want to say I do read Bale's last works. My translation of his last work will be published by Brill in the, oh. in the next year. <laughs> but also I just want to point out that Bale wrote in a letter well, to his... That's very good to know. To his very, <laughs> Bale wrote to his very good friend, uh, and he had no reason to lie. His very last words were, je meurs un philosophe chrétien. I die a Christian philosopher. And he uh, didn't have any reason to lie in a letter, I don't think. Yeah, but, uh, but his, his, his very close friend, Banage, who had always given him the benefit of the doubt, was uh, after his death, uh, told his friends he felt that he'd been deceived by Bale and that Bale was no Christian philosopher. Uh, at the end or at any, at any time in his later years. Of course, he, he had been at an earlier stage. So I think there's room for, for disagreement. Uh, Jonathan, I would like to ask the following question, which is more a philosophical than history of ideas question. Why do you believe that the quest for giving an ontological foundation for morals, which is... Sorry, I didn't the, catch that. The quest for giving... As Iris Murdoch once said, religion will remain with us as long as we look for some foundation of goodness in being. Why do you think that this type of thought, which Leibniz represents in a very subtle and complex way, is necessarily inimical to the great moral changes that occur in the 18th century and that you link very plausibly to a certain interpretation of Spinoza? I think that one of the arguments that you used was that if you are a Leibnizian, you must accept the world as it is, and therefore you are against change. But that is not true. Leibniz himself writes a short text, An Mundus Perfectione Crescat. It's not in the Gerhard edition of the 19th century. It was published only in the 20th century, in which he deals with this question and says, am I committed, as someone who believes that the world is the best possible um, uh, world, 
to deny that there can be moral progress. And he says, no, he struggles with the issue, but at the end he clearly says, no, it may be interpreted as a sign of the increase of value. It is itself a manifestation of a principle of plenitude. We have more values in so far as we have a development. And if you have this way, then you can have the progressive political philosophy that you want to have on the basis of a commitment to the idea that after all the universe is a likely place for implementing the moral law. If the universe is completely amoral, as Spinoza or Hume think, it is not completely clear why there is any chance that the moral law and ideas that correspond to moral law can get a foothold in it, can convince people um, particularly if you, as a Spinozian, accept also the determinist system. What guarantees that in this natural system there is place for the implementation of the moral ideas that you want to defend? Well, that, that's a very powerful question, Vittorio, and you're a better philosopher than I am. But I can only answer that, uh, the, the, as I mentioned halfway through the lecture, there was a very widespread awareness of uh, not just the need for the reform, but how sweeping the problems of institutions, laws, and political system were. Very, very serious on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and if um, the, the, the reason that I think that is that if you accept as most Enlightenment writers did, and as Leibniz did more eloquently than any of the others, that the world is divinely guided and is for the best, it's very hard to argue that the entire legal, social, institutional, political system is all rotten and has to be thrown out the window. This is an element of contradiction in this position. But the 18th century, um, uh, the, 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 the radical wing, that those that were labeled Spinozas, were precisely the ones historically who um, were most easily able to say that we must accept that the whole legal institutional structure is rotten and throw it away and start again. And I think uh, as uh, uh, Ferguson at one point, who's of course a great believer in divine providence, says he's, he, he's quite willing to have reforms as long as you do it gradually and keep the shape of the house uh, basically intact. But if you're going to start taking all the walls away and allow the roof to fall in and so on, as those people want to do, then that's quite a different conception of reform. And uh, what I'm arguing is that, uh, that there is a contradiction between uh, embracing the idea of divine guidance and providence of the world uh, and saying that uh, the whole institutional structure and legal structure, which after all are based on a moral order, which therefore itself must somehow be wrong, as all these Spinozists were arguing. So it's much more logical if you want to change the whole political and institutional structure to say that the legal, that the moral values underpinning the, the um, corrupt and pernicious and outmoded legal structures that we have uh, I like this because we've been misled by, uh, by, by a priesthood and by a religion which are not telling us the truth, which are deceiving mankind. And th all of this is much easier to argue and much more consistently argued, I think, within a Spinozistic framework which is, re rejects teleology and divine providence. It does seem to me uh, simply uh, logical that it should be so, that, that, mo that moderate enlightenment inherently goes better with a providential uh, conception of reality, and radical enlightenment inherently and logically uh, sits more easily with a non-providential conception of reality. Time for, for two more questions, uh, relatively brief. Uh, yeah, so there was a lot in this talk, obviously. So. I was just, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about your uh, setup of the different camps. So there was on the one side the providential camp, on the other side the materialist camp, and Bale was packed in there too because he wasn't really a theist, so, you know, that was undermining. Um, and so uh, Hume turned out to be actually in the first camp, maybe also somewhat surprisingly. Well, in a way, in a way. In a way. But so I was wondering, you know, since we're talking about the Enlightenment and all of that, what happened to reason? I mean, actually, so what I'm kind of uncomfortable with is having Kant in the first category uh, and, you know, 
not, I mean, turning out to be one of the bad 